The Big Story. It wasn't any different from usual. He came home late. Uh, Your husband? And he knew it was going to be one of his insomniac nights. He said, I won't sleep. So he took his handkerchief and he poured some chloroform on it. Uh, Chloroform? He called it the scent of the gods. He took a little and put it on his handkerchief, put the handkerchief over his face, and went to sleep. He had done it many times before. You used to take chloroform to go to sleep? At about five, I thought I heard a noise downstairs. I said, Harold, please see what it is. And I reached over and touched him, and he was cold. Harold was dead. Hartford, Connecticut. From the pages of the Hartford Times comes the story of Puritan morality and violent death. Hartford, Connecticut. The story as it actually happened. Albert Prince's story as he lived it. It was a scoop, a clean scoop, and you had been scooped. There it was in black and white on the front pages of the opposition paper. Wife finds husband dead in bed. Harold Duran, prominent meteorologist and weather expert, dead of chloroform poisoning. But the scoop didn't bother you much, Albert Prince, reporter of the Hartford Times. Not really. Sure, it hurts to be scooped. But what really bothered you was that you knew Harold Durand. Knew him for a quiet, good-looking, middle-aged scientist. A member of the Hartford Weather Bureau. Accurate, conservative, easy with reporters. The man almost everybody turned to first in the paper to see what today's weather was going to be like, or tomorrow's. What hit you, disturbed you, made you restless, was that there was something weird about it. That was the only word that accurately described it. Weird. Harold Duran and chloroform. So, to clear up the weirdness of it, you sat now on the porch of a nice house in East Hartford, where the widow Duran speaks to you in her small, controlled voice. We had been married 25 years. We were going to celebrate our silver anniversary at my folks' house in Stoneham, Massachusetts. She stops, musing on what that 25th celebration might have been like. And you look at the face. Not an attractive woman. A woman who never learned to dress. A woman who was not allowed by her upbringing... To give in to vanity. A woman with thin, pale lips and thin, long fingers. A frail woman, weighing no more than a hundred pounds. Pure Puritan stock. We were childhood friends in Stoneham. We played together as children. We married there in my father's big house. Mrs. Durand, I knew your husband pretty well. I heard him lecture at the university. I even read some of his scientific articles... Such a clear, clean mind. He was like that in everything. Harold was the kind of man you dream about and meet once in a lifetime. How does a man like that wind up with, well, uh, drugs? The chloroform? I don't know what to say. Only that he worked so hard. He was too tired to sleep so often. Where'd he get it? A man doesn't just buy chloroform in a drugstore. I never thought of that. But if you knew how seriously he took his work, ships at sea depended on his accuracy, and airplanes and farmers, even banks used to call, and... Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I beg your pardon? I've kept you out on the porch. I've offered you nothing. Oh, that's all right. I didn't even ask you inside. Surely a cup of tea. I know I'd like a cup. For a moment, she was out of herself. Just a brief moment. 
But now the Puritan morality, the politeness, the kindness to other people asserts itself. The tight, pinched face has the smile hostesses use when you walk into a restaurant. Have a cup of tea? Well, thank you. I, I don't want to trouble you, but I would appreciate it. And it almost seemed normal. The bereaved woman talking, offering tea on the porch of a house like any other house on the clean street. Then you find yourself in the living room. The altar hits you first. A red lacquered base, bright as a fire engine, rising three feet above the oriental rug in the center of the large wall. Candles in profusion, burning, perhaps a hundred, at the foot of the altar and at the apex. And an idol, a fantastic idol. Three hideous monkeys, half life-size, grinning, smirking, glaring, their eyes fantastically real, as if there were life inside these grotesque monsters. And the sweet, almost sickeningly sweet aroma. And then its source. Two blue incense burners, the odor of musk and sandal. A fantastic horror in this ordinary house. Most people didn't know about that, about Harold. But Harold was a cultist, you see. Harold was a disciple, a student of metaphysics, a believer in the inner life, the pure light, the sanctified light. I see something in the bedroom. I, I didn't mean to look in. Another but... altar, the main one. This one here was for the ordinary days. The one in the bedroom for cult days. Here's your tea. Cream. Lemon. Sugar. You never tasted the tea. Never saw it. Never smelled it. You could never take your eyes from those two fantastic altars. Your nose was filled with the burning incense. And even now, a block from the house, the same word, weird, weird, again weird, had been planted almost physically in your mind. For a conservative scientific meteorologist with a Puritan wife, this comes to your mind. Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her father 40 wax. A famous poem forms in your mind. The story of the New England woman years ago named Lizzie Borden killed her father with an axe. And you find yourself sitting, talking to a very flat, very smart, very skeptical detective, name of Sergeant McGovern. Well, whatever it is you're after, Al, I'll lay you eight to one, you got nothing. Why are you so sure? Why? Because I, too, am about to celebrate my silver anniversary. Twenty-five years at this desk. Look, Mac, you never gave me a bum steer. Now, just answer me this question. Yeah. Were the Durans ever, at any time in the last ten years, in any trouble, difficulties, maybe even a fight? Look, just because you went to somebody's house and they haven't got it furnished the way you think they ought to have it furnished... Well, you you've seen in... that altar, the monkey... I the... never was in the house... But I get the general idea. Even so, okay, it's crazy. Incense, sandalwood, candles, monkeys. So I got a collection of Fearless Fosdick. Am I suspect number two in your book? Now, please, don't get wise with me. Mac, were they ever in there? Ever? Anytime? Um, Durant. Durant, uh... Wait, wait a minute. Catherine Durant, Harold Durant. Yeah, it was two years ago, in the fall, I think. I was on the desk... The two of them came in, Mr. and Mrs. Durant. What a scene, too. You know how that kind of person whispers? Well, that's what they were doing. But loud. Why did you have to come here? We could have settled it. I've had enough. We don't have to. Sergeant, it's all a misunderstanding. I'm going to take my wife home now. Well, now, just a second, if you please. What is this all about? It's absolutely nothing. She's just a little upset, and... You, uh, uh, you think that I could hear it from the lady? The things he says, the things he does, the kind of things he brings home, the kind of things I have to put up with. Catherine, for heaven's sake. Like, uh... Like what, lady? What kind of things, huh? Since when, Catherine, do we have to make our private affairs public? I... It's nothing, Sergeant. 
I think I did something very foolish coming here and bothering you. Well, now, now, just a moment, please. You started to say something, and then all of a sudden... I'm very sorry. There's nothing to talk about, and I think I would really like to go home with my husband. (laughs) A family affair, Sergeant, that I just let get a little away from me. Well, that's all there was to it, Al. So they had a tiff. They came in. They decided not to have the tiff in front of me anyhow. Oh, that doesn't jibe. 25 years of blissful harmony, childhood sweethearts. I don't believe it. You don't believe what? I don't believe things are the way they seem. Now, look, I'm not kidding, Mac. I'm asking you a straight question. Could this be murder? Mur- <laughs> the medical examiner's report says accidental death by asphyxia, chloroform poisoning. The guy thought he knew how much he was taking. He took a little more than he thought. And why couldn't it be that someone gave him a little more than he took? On account of the medical examiner looked into that aspect. On account of two of my best men interviewed Mrs. Durant. On account of pigs don't whistle. You seriously think that frightened little lady you think she killed the husband she'd been married to for 25 years? Remember the poem, Lizzie Borden oh. took an axe, gave her father yeah. 40 wax? Yeah, I know. And when the job was nicely done, she gave her mother 41? Oh, you're out of your head. Okay, Mac, I've been wrong before. But then again, once in a while, I've also been right. Cy Harris, returning it to your narrator and the big story of Albert I. Prince as he lived it and wrote it. There's got to be more to this dead man. This meteorologist scientist, Harold Duran. This bizarre cultist with the incense and the candles and the monkeys in his living room and bedroom. There must be other bizarre things. Other weird aspects. An ordinary man doesn't take chloroform before he goes to sleep at night. And a conservative scientist, even less. Other what? Other women? Other practices in his cult? You want to know more. And so you say all this, you, Albert Prince, reporter. You say all this to Ernie McGovern, Sergeant Mack to you. And he says... Now, look, I'm just not interested in this case anymore. The fellow died of accidental asphyxia. All right, all right. Accidental asphyxia. Yeah. Will you give me permission to go into his office down at the Weather Bureau, maybe his house? I got no right to give permission like that. All right, at least you know about it if I get picked up for, oh, I don't know, snooping, I guess, or breaking or entering or something. Well, my advice is to you, don't snoop, don't break, and don't enter. Oh, go on. Go take a trip down to Yale. The boys are having a good football game there tomorrow afternoon. Look, I still like the Lizzie Borden theory. Boy, are we stubborn this morning. Well, anyhow, you know what I'm doing. The Weather Bureau was neat, precise, quiet. With the big maps on the wall. All kinds of gadgets, meters, barometers, anemometers. Things you've vaguely heard about but never looked at before. And the quiet, distinguished-looking cubbyhole and the closed door with a name neatly lettered, Harold Duran. Why, I'm terribly sorry. You can't go in there. Um, I'm from the Times, and we want to do a story on Mr. Duran. Uh, did you know him well? I was his secretary. Uh, well, miss, you can help me if you'd like to, and I think help him, too, if you wanted He was the nicest boss a girl ever had. Sweet, thoughtful. Uh, Could I ask your name? Susan Reiner. Miss Reiner, I know he was working on an annual report, a summary of some kind. And I thought it would be a tribute if we, uh, the paper that is, brought it out. Or maybe he said something about it. He'd like that. So, won't you help me? I'm sorry. If you want to go in, go ahead. But his things are all in there and I... Just couldn't bring myself to do it. Oh, that's okay, Miss Reiner. I'll get the story myself. A devoted secretary, upset, as everybody who knew him apparently is. So you don't like yourself exactly for what you're doing. His papers are just papers. 
comparative high lows, years 1946, 47, 48. New England precipitation, 1948, 49. Weather prediction accuracy ratios, 1941 through 1949. Nothing here. And then, in a small mahogany humidor, he didn't smoke. A packet of letters and a diary. And when you've glimpsed at the first few words, you can't wait to get out of the office and into a place where you can read what you've gotten. You find a bar, and you get a beer in a quiet corner with a small light, and you start first the diary, reading... Property of Catherine Durand. Her book. Entry. I don't think I can take it anymore. It's got to stop. It's got to stop. Entry ten days later. I know what's been going on. It's him and that girl. I know it. I thought I could deceive myself, but I can't anymore. Entry three days later. One week before the death of Harold Durand. Now I know finally exactly what it is I have to do about them. But especially about him. <laughs> You almost stop there, almost get up, almost run to Sergeant Mac. But there are those letters. Letters dated from a year ago. Oh, my darling, when you're away from me, all I can think of are those kiss kisses that just you and I have alone in the world. The letter dated three months later. When are you coming back from Boston? When can I see the people I meet? This is my husband, Harold. When? Letter dated one month before the death of Harold Duran. Harold, I don't know what you're doing. Why are you lecturing so much away from home and away from me? You said we were going to be married. If you've been lying to me, I don't know what I'll do. But I'll do something. And the name, the name on all the letters. Susan. Susan Reiner, a devoted secretary who couldn't go in the room because she couldn't bring herself to touch his things. At headquarters, Sergeant Mack listens. As you tell him, you're more convinced than ever that Dr. Jekyll, scientist Harold Duran, was Mr. Hyde as far as Susan Reiner was concerned. When you both confront her, she says... You must be out of your mind suggesting a thing like that. I loved him. I always loved him. Okay, I... you loved him. Only it says here in your writing, if you are lying to me, Harold, I don't know what I'll do. But you know what I meant, Sergeant, for heaven's sake. All I meant was I would go out of my mind. Harold and I were... Yeah, you were special. The first two people on earth that really loved each other. Just one little question. Where were you on the night that he was killed? Killed? Killed. I was... Home with my father, my mother, my sister, and my older brother. Can they verify that? Do they have to? I mean, do you really think I... And Mac is quietly shaking his head. And so are you, Albert Prince. Because it's obvious, very obvious, she didn't do it. She's confused. She's disturbed. She was in love, and he wasn't coming through on his promises. But she didn't do it. Somebody did. Lizzie Borton gave her father 40 wax. Yeah, that's my sentiments, too. But if things are, as in this case they are, hardly what they seem, and it is a Lizzie Borton, a violent, passionate woman, inside a calm, Puritan exterior, then it's a delicate instrument that has to be played carefully. No slugging, no rapid-fire cross-examination is going to bring this out. And Mac agrees. And so you and Sergeant Mac go and sit on the porch with her. There uh, was never anything wrong, was there, between you? I thought I told you everything you wanted to know, Mr. Prince. Hmm. It was one of those marriages made in heaven, wasn't it? Why do you torture me like this? What do you want? 
A childhood romance and a marriage that sweetened and ripened every year it lasted. Please. There were no complaints by you against him, were there, ever? Please go. You never went to the police and said he beat you, said he treated you badly. Go, 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 go. You, uh, you remember me, Mrs. Durant? No. I think you do. I think you remember coming into the police station about two years ago with your husband. Doesn't break with that woman. I know now what I've got to do. No, 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 no. Susan Reiner. Susan and Harold. Susan. I did it. Why? Why, Mrs. Duran? Why? First, he used to ask me to make lunch. He used to eat his lunch in the office. It was always two sandwiches, two apples, two pieces of cake. I used to think what an appetite he had. And then I realized how foolish I had been. For over two years, I used to make lunch for her every day. Susan? And then he used to bring her to the house for dinner. And I would cook for him and her. And they would eat dinner and talk meteorology, talk weather. And after dinner, I would do the dishes, and they would go upstairs to his room to work. He and Susan? The cruelty was always polite. The humiliation always done with gentility. Oh, dear Lord, how I hated the cult, the incense, the altar, the hideous statue, those vulgar burning lights. And one night, he came home, and he fell down on the bed and said to me, Get me the bottle. You're not going to take that again. Give me the nectar of the gods, the scent of the angels. Give it to me. Don't stand there looking like a jackass. All right, Harold. Here you are. A few drops and a handkerchief. I shall taste the beauties of oriental sleep. The sleep of forgetfulness. It would be the greatest joy in the world some night to go out. To go on and on until you go out. On an everlasting diet of sleep. Get out of the room. You sicken me. And so I waited until he'd fallen asleep. And then I walked back in. The bottle was beside the bed, on a table, the chloroform. And as I poured it, I said to him, You want to go out on an everlasting diet of sleep, Harold? You will, Harold, on a diet of everlasting sleep. I did it. And may the Lord have mercy on my soul. Now we read you that telegram from Albert Prince of the Hartford Times. When questioned in her cell... Murderess in tonight's big story calmly repeated all the gruesome details which led to the killing of her husband. In court, although nervous, she pleaded guilty to a charge of manslaughter. She was sentenced to the state prison at Wethersfield. And so ends another big story. In order to protect the names of people actually involved in tonight's authentic big story, the names of all characters in the dramatization were changed with the exception of the newspaper reporter. The big story has been a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.